I had a mindset that I'm going to do what it takes to survive first. Smandra Maya, founder of Authentic Health, a health and lifestyle advice service based on an individual's biology. Thank you so much for coming in and joining me today on Gary Talks. I had a moment when I said, I don't want to live like this. I just, I can't live like this. I only have one life. Self-advocate. Don't be afraid to put yourself first. You wouldn't have had a very emotional relationship with your mother. Unfortunately not. This is a GK Media Podcast. Smandra, Maya, you have an amazing story to tell. Growing up in Romania, moving to Ireland at the age of 35 with your eight-year-old son, not having really a word of English, and now finding and setting up your own business, which is making such a difference in people's life. And also, I think more importantly, is creating more awareness into how we treat our own bodies in terms of health, medicine, lifestyle, wellness, and so on. You're very welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. You moved to Ireland nine years ago from Romania. Yes, that's true. What was your expectations of Ireland when you arrived compared to the reality? <laughs> this question makes me laugh because I think was the um, ignorance as a bliss what brought me here. And I didn't know much about Ireland when I came. What I knew that I'm going to be in a town called Clonmel, okay. what has a river. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a major for me because I was coming from a city with a river and I was doing my morning runs. Um, okay. And I said, okay, that I didn't know much about the weather. I've been told that I can have two or three seasons in a day, seasons in a day. And I said, okay, fine. And I had a mindset that I'm going to do what it takes to survive first and to start uh, my a new life. And if that's going to happen in a positive way, I will bring my son because my son was eight at the time. And I came because I was forced economically. So I went through a divorce. And in Romania, by law, when you divorce as a woman and a single mom, you have no rights, no support, no nothing. I'm not saying that it's good to have everything because I think I, I'm a big believer in we are both equals, but not having at all any support, it was a tough moment. And I came after I had a brilliant uh, corporate uh, career with uh, company car and all that being a successful medical representative and ending up having to choose between being a single mother with no support from family and my job, my career. So obvious, naturally. I choose my son and being a mom, which was the best decision I ever made. But economically, I was nowhere. So I wasn't able to pay rent. I wasn't able to... I lost everything, by the way. So after 10 years being married and making a home and all that, I choose between having my son full time yeah. uh, and having uh, belongings so I didn't mind that. It was, again, a bit of nuisance if you look at material part, but to me it made a lot of sense. Everything that I put, I put for the sake of Lucas, my son and myself. So I came and I said, I'm going to do anything I will get to because I didn't have English. My English was, hi, how are you? And when that was actually the biggest shock that my English, what I learned in during the school years, was nothing to do with the English yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So the accent and uh, I wasn't able to understand a lot of the words and all that. So because I was on my own, uh, 
I had a friend, okay? So the way how I came was my friend, my best friend's daughter, she came in Clonmel because her doctor's husband, my hus- her husband uh, is a doctor, and he got a job in the hospital, and they came in February 2015. So she said, okay, go, and Catherine is going to give you a room. And I said, okay, fair enough, like, I can do that. The most dramatic part is that I financially, I came with 120 euro in my pocket and a small suitcase that's, I didn't have money for a cabin um, luggage to bring more belongings. So I just came with that and I said, I'm going to, and I had a three week uh, return ticket bought from home and I said I actually printed CVs and all that in Romania I came with them and I said I'm trying for three weeks to get a job no matter what is the job so I forgot and what were you qualified in in, when you were living in Romania I forgot all my qualifications so I had to because otherwise that was the, the, the hardest part I was having two master degrees in Romania so one was in communication and public relations and this is the closest to my heart and the second was in social economy and I had to forget that because no matter how much I knew in my own language in my own head I couldn't express that yeah. here I was a marketer so I was working for myself just before I came as a um, marketing digital marketing and marketing but I said okay I have nothing to to share there. I don't know about their market. I don't know. So better is to leave everything behind and go to d- see what's there and what you can do. So I googled and I said there are two hotels. I definitely will be able to do. I'm not afraid of work. Mm. And so that's the bottom line. I'm not afraid of work. So I'm going to do whatever they have. Laundry, housekeeping, whatever. Gods were with me because I went in the first hotel and I had uh, an interview with the owner and I got a job in the breakfast team. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. was a waitress, but the the supervisor was coming from the same city. I did know nothing about that. So I had no idea. The best thing what that girl, she's currently in Clonmel and we are still in touch and whatever, God bless her heart, uh, or she, she's Hungarian. And she said to me, the best thing what I can do for you is not to speak Romanian with you. Yeah. And I, I could not agree more. Yeah, true. So when I came, I was 35. Knowing what I know now about the neuroscience and biology and all that, my brain was already strong in Romanian. So the neural pathway for learning a new language was not as easy as it was for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Or for my son when he came. So the best decision what I could make was to start speaking solely in, in English alone. So not talking in Romanian anymore. And we decided together in 2017 after, so Fast forward, I brought my son, everything was okay, and I started to um, study in English. So in 2017, when I got my first job, qualified kind of, I said to Lucas, let's go, because I couldn't switch from talking at home in Romanian and next morning going in, being medical secretary in a private hospital, speaking in English. I felt very hard. I felt that my Romanian words are slipping in, in a moment when, and then I get frustrated and I said, no, I'm not doing that. So I just turned everything on English and that's it. Like, I know my, my accent is not going to change, but obvious I can express feelings and I can, and I remember that it was, I think, January 2016. And my biggest wish was to be able to express feelings in English because that was so hard for a person. And I don't know if, if you can relate I heard a lot of foreigners, Polish and all that, uh, telling when I fight with my partner or whatever, I 
use my own language because I'm not able to express. And I was, I was fascinating. I said, that's so interesting. Now I understand because the work that I'm doing, I understand how easy it is to express emotions in your own language when you think yeah. in, in, in that language. Yeah, well, so. like my in-laws are Italian. Uh, now they do have good English, but um, sometimes when they be saying something, I would find it hard to speak back with giving my opinion because I don't have the Italian to communicate it and they wouldn't have the English to comprehend the words which might be more, um, there wouldn't be common English phrases, it'd be more like an Irish saying or something like that. And it, it's it's suddenly with, within seconds, it's this massive frustration because you're not able to express yourself. And uh, it really just changed dynamics in relationships in terms of having that lack of communication. Yeah. And it's, it's such a simple thing on the outset, but when you're in the middle of it, it's a very frustrating oh, process totally. to have all Absolutely. the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What was the reception like for you as a Romanian coming to Ireland? First of all, I found the difference in the level of stress uh, was less. But now I know stress is a perception of what's going on of inside. So probably it, I was very stressed when I came in Ireland. And I found that because the level of uh, acceptance and support what I perceived in mm -hmm. the outside towards me was so open. I I just, I felt extraordinary. And now going back and looking at the um, society and the um, um, patterns. So because I, we came from, a, I'm coming from a country with a very, in communism, we we didn't have the, the freedom. Yeah, We couldn't express ourselves. And also we didn't have much. I think the levels of stress were inherited from generation to generation. So the stress was a norm. Yeah. You, there was no such thing that have put your feet up. When I heard that first time, I was like, what do you mean put your feet up? Like that's something what you need to earn. And then I realized, oh, it's actually the norm and you deserve as just human being. You rest. I'm coming from a country where... Because uh, you grew up during communism in Romania. Yes, yeah. So I was 10 when the revolution happened. And you have to think of, um, in Romania, there is no uh, the conception of being a mom at home. No, you couldn't afford that. So everything is so, uh, is different. So the mom had to juggle the career and... Yes, I think that the care, the child care system is much better than in Ireland. Yeah. In that case, it was. I have to step back and think that nine years ago, mm -hmm. I, I don't know much about how it's now, but uh, nine years ago was much um, available, like mm -hmm. uh, easier to get a stage of two years of age until six. By the way, my son was seven. You don't bring them to the school. You, we didn't used to. So you put them on the bus, okay, and they're going. This I, is in Romania. Yes, yeah. that used to be. Yeah, I have to be very careful because I don't know exactly well, how it is now. now yeah, yeah, exactly. So my, I grew up with the key on my, like a necklace, necklace on my. So, I, like, are you saying that relationships between mother and child in Romania back then, because of communism, was a very kind of cold relationship? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, I mean, um, I'm, I'm giving you nuggets of what I'm doing now to kind of reparent that. So, for example, I'm journaling on a regular basis. I wouldn't say every morning, but yeah, most of the mornings. And I love you, sweetheart, is what I give myself now mm. because I never heard that as a child. Because, you, like, is it, it fair and to say that, that was the norm. But you don't... you did, wouldn't have had a very emotional relationship with your mother. Unfortunately not. And it's very interesting how I felt weird because of that. As a child, I always felt that I'm not performing as a good child. Now, this is what I've been told, mm. but that was what I took and I embedded in my own mind that I am not 
as everyone else because I'm not able to please my mom. So, and that was, I don't know how I, what to do with that information when I was emotionally not developed and all that. So what, how I, I took advantage of the, of the situation in Romania, when you are 14, you need, you need it. It's kind of, I think it's some sort of similarity now in the system, but you have the option of going to study in a dormitory kind of in a boarding school. It's not even a boarding school. It's a, in a different, to give you a, you leave home. Mm. Economically, I think it's because the houses uh, are very small in Romania and it's like my mom couldn't wait for having an extra space in the house because we were so... Uh, you and your brother. Yeah, exactly. And we only had two rooms. It was like a very small apartment and it was like a box, really. And I, I, for me, was, oh, I escaped from that emotional burden what I felt and I don't have to be so under her control now being coming back to the present I realized that my mom was a narcissistic ha she has a narcissistic behavior she didn't know back then I didn't know myself I did a lot of work in the meantime because it was took a, it was taking a toll on my emotional and mental health and I didn't know where it's coming from a part of blaming me so much and not knowing what to do with those feelings. It was tough for a person to kind of, I felt that sadness and frustration that something was taken from me and everything what happened, what happened to me. And now I changed the perspective. Everything mm. happens for me and happened for me because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Otherwise I wouldn't be so knowledgeable and so um, enlightened, I say. And this is a gift and so open to accept and see those things. But um, it was hard when you are playing in a victim mode. Everything happened to you, happens to you. It's very um, heavy. Uh, uh, how, it feels heavy. But how does that define you then as a child growing up where you don't really have a strong bond with you know, your mother and then they're narcissistic and they're telling you that you don't, you know, satisfy them, you don't make them happy. Like what sort of, how were you defining yourself as a person then when you were a child? I think I was living in two worlds. Uh, in school, I was very appreciated. Okay. And I took a lot from that. But at home, no matter what I did, I could not please her, not a hope. Like, and it was kind of a contradiction there in my head, and I didn't know what to do. I felt like um, doesn't make any sense. I had a lot of moments in my life when I said, "I, it's not making any sense to me," and I was blaming myself that I'm probably a little bit weird that I'm I'm feeling that, and I tried hard to please her. Definitely. So, and what about your father? Did he intervene? Was he the opposite of her? I don't know if you know a little bit about the narcissist uh, behavior, narcissistic behavior in people. They are very controlling. Okay, um, and definitely, both of them came from different backgrounds. One was countryside farmer. That was my mom, and my dad was fr coming from a very Academic, uh, academic. Yeah. Yes, my grandparents, and I do have a lot uh, to to recognize and to um, a lot of gratitude towards my uh, paternal grandma mm. because she was a teacher, and a lot of my what I am now I'm because of her, and she passed um, in 2012, and I felt like that was the moment when I'm a very spiritual person. If um, I need to say that it's not obvious from the way how I'm talking. Uh, I felt after she passed, I could actually felt my strength from a different angle, from a different level. And I, I always say that if she wouldn't passed in 2012, probably I couldn't um, take the decision of divorce in 2013 and all that. So I felt like my angel moved in different dim dimension to... Uh, take care of me. 
And when you say that, you know, after she passed in 2012, that's when you made some big life changes, you know, uh, getting divorced, leaving your home country, moving to a country where you didn't speak the language, mm. starting from scratch and all that. It, you know, the fact that you made the decision after she passed, is it that, and I don't be putting words in your mouth, but is it that you didn't want to disappoint her by getting divorced and leaving the country while she was alive? Or is it that you realized life was short? No, I, I don't know exactly what was on the background, what happened in my subconscious mind, because I'm a big believer of we are only 5% aware and what we are doing, it's only 5% of what we are actually thinking. Okay, <laughs> we okay. are not aware of the 95% unless we start digging and bring awareness and shine a light of the 95%. That's programming. And I don't know exactly what was happening in the 95%, but what I felt was the strength of an intuition what I didn't have before. All of a sudden, that intuition, what I absolutely, I'm in love with that intuition now. Okay. I'm, I'm living by that intuition is there and it shows me the way and gives me the strength. Yeah. And yeah. the fact that in 20, so I got married in 2004 and that was after I was very sick in the hospital. And my mom was obvious with me. I was 23 years old. And, and why were you sick in the hospital? Uh, because I have spine um, issues. So I had scoliosis. Okay. As very young. And I was in a first time hospitalized because of my pain in my back. And So what are the symptoms of scoliosis? So basically you have an S in your spine. So yeah. your spine is uh, curved. But my spine was so curved that in 2008 I had to have a surgery because my right lung was um in very tight in the in among my ribs yeah, and yeah, yeah. i couldn't breathe and anyway my mom was telling me while i was in hospital and i wasn't it was a flared up uh, inflammation in my back and i couldn't walk properly and i was just finishing my college uh last year i think in college and my mom told me you better get married. In Romania, what used to be, you, so you go to the college, you get married towards the end of the college, and then you have the child, and then career and whatever. Like, that's a choice, mm. a lifestyle kind of choice. Yeah. But she was a victim of the society in that case, and I don't really blame, blame her. But I will never forget what um, she told me, you can choose as a woman, you have to be chosen. And Say that again, you can't choose, you have to be chosen. So you can't choose who to fall in love with. And this is, this is like 2004. Yeah. So I remember like it was today, I was in a hospital in that ward and she was telling me that and this um man who became my husband i was in a short relationship with him and i didn't like his family so my intuition told me that but i wasn't listening to my intuition i didn't yeah. know like i didn't so i kind of felt like no it's not for me i met his family i did not like at all what i saw but my mom told me my mom which i tried to please all my life told me you can't choose, you have to be chosen. So he was kind of falling in love with me and whatever. So I was, you know, you are anyway handicapped physically. That's what my mom told me. You can't, definitely you can't choose. You are not in a position to choose. And I was like, okay, so I better get married. So I did. And I ended up after 10 years, crying every day like that was the moment when I I, I said I know. and I had a revelation kind of I remember exactly I was living uphill and I used to walk in the town in the downtown and I remember going downhill and hearing I had that I, I had I was crying every moment when I, I left the house like I didn't feel home at mm -hmm. all but I had a moment when I said 
I don't want to live this like like this. I just I can't live like this. I only have one life, and I have to choose. And that was kind of the moment, like you actually can choose. So that walk, I remember like was yesterday, and I still when I have tough days, I still remember that. And what happened afterwards is what brought me here, here in the now where I am now, and what I yeah. We'll, we'll speak shortly about the amazing work you're doing and what I love so much about the work that you're doing and the importance of it uh, and that shift that is needed in um, our lifestyle and in the way we consume medicine and food and so on. Um, medicine in inverted comma, shall we say. But I just want to go back to the story of, you know, when you divorced in Romania uh, and we were talking before we came into studio here about kind of the different conditions mm-hmm. of, you know, getting the green light for divorce and then how it becomes more difficult if those boxes aren't ticked. Can you talk to me about those, but also the reality of what it's actually like as a as a mother, as a woman going through divorce and having a young child in the middle of it? Mm-hmm. So, as I said, I was a medical representative for uh, nearly 10 years at that stage. And I had a bit of cushion, a financial cushion, just to keep me for, because I knew I'm going to leave the home, a family home, uh, which, by the way, was my husband's parents' home. Uh, we invested a lot. We transformed kind of house, but um, it was still their own. And... I had a bit of cushion to keep me for six months, rent and all that. So were you saving this money on the side? Like yes. Not saying it. So I decided that I'm going to divorce in 2012, um, kind of towards the end of the year. And I left the home in April. 2013. Okay. And the divorce, uh, the, the last uh, court was in November 2013. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you said the last court, there's a number of sessions Yeah, it can in the go court. for years, but because I decided that I am not asking for any belongings and or anything like that. Uh, so you went, wanted nothing. You just yeah, wanted I to, wanted just to get divorced. Yeah, exactly. And just go. Yeah. And I wanted to have my son. So in Romania it's easier to get divorced if the husband is an alcoholic or Abusive. Uh, abusive uh, 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 not emotional abuse. Emotional abuse, I don't know how it's now, but there is no, not a thing legally. Uh, so if he's uh, physically abusive, uh, alcoholic or... Uh, no, he cheated. Okay, that's another thing. Uh, but And if he's in jail. Yeah. And so, he, he... Obvious was not the case. Yeah. Yeah, so none of them. My reason the way how I saw was that he wasn't capable to be a responsible parent. And I said, okay, I'm not going to have the second child because I couldn't because of my back. Um, And it was to put my life in danger, another pregnancy. And uh, I just, I felt like I do not want to bring the same generation, generational pattern into my son's life I said it's enough one that suffered and didn't understand the the uh, my world was didn't have meaning for me until recently very recently in the last three years and I said I need I felt that it's my mission to break that generational pattern no matter what so for me that my son is going to be an emotional balanced human being is like for someone else probably having millions in the bank or assets or whatever. So this is for me, if that happens, I am the richest human being in the world. And it's something so so many of us would take for granted. We uh, presume our children are emotionally balanced. It's not something we, you know, generally strive for or try to change things. Uh, uh, you You know, if they're happy, they're content, they're playing games. 
you know, yes. you just take it that it's a default that should be there yeah. in society. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm not going to start to talk about that topic too much, but probably because I had only one and we were so closed. And after he was here with me, only with me and whatever, I'm, I kind of started to pay attention to things what we usually don't. And every time when I actually saw that he's angry or he's frustrated and n not the norm, mm. I started to dig with questions and I started to pull because he's a man and he's not easy and he's an introvert, 100%. Uh, very emotionally balanced, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> and I'm delighted to see that. And... Uh, when you are connected to your child, now I I only can speak from a perspective of having one child. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know when how is to have two or three, but when you uh, pay attention to signals, there is no way that you can't fix things. As long as like I'm not saying to force. I'm not saying I'm not a, a believer in over discipline or force things like that, but. There is an emotion there that is not met. Mm. And if you pay attention to signals, you definitely, you have the power. As uh, That's my belief, that you are uh, in charge of that as a parent. So you grew up in Romania, in initially communist Romania, mm -hmm. and... You know, you had a challenging relationship with your mother, which as an effect had a knock on issue with your father as well, because he was controlled by your mom. You had scoliosis. You got married, got divorced with a nine-year-old son in your mid-30s, moved to Ireland, knew nothing about it except that there was a river in Clonmel, <laughs> uh, had to really learn the language and pretty much just over 10 years ago from when you got divorced, you're here now living in Ireland. Your son has done the leaving cert. Yes, he did. He Thanks wants to him. touch He wood, got become, his driving license Monday, so. <laughs> he wants to become a chef. Yes. Uh, and possibly move somewhere in Europe to actually study in one of the, the, the top universities. And we won't mention yes, the we astronomical won't mention. fees involved. I hope to God that my two <laughs> girls that I have just decide to do a nice basic course <laughs> in Galway. Um, I, 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 I nearly went grey when I heard the prices involved in um, university fees over in other parts of Europe. But um, yeah, and, and you're making plans to try and make mm. that happen for them, which is amazing. But you have your own business now. And I remember the day I met you, we were at an All-Ireland Business uh, foundation, found, meeting, foundation yeah. yeah and you said something to me and it really really stuck with me you said you know I, I i'm involved in lifestyle and health and nutrition and so on and i believe that you know most of us if not all of us don't need to be on medication 100 percent, 100 percent. and i'm coming recently nearly out of an infection sinus infection and I still, I'm not a saint and I'm talking, I'm walking my talk. I still, I was still debating to go on antibiotics or not to go on antibiotics. I mean, I had full signs and symptoms of a sinus infection and it went on for nearly two months. Wow. Okay. So up and down, I'll better go back and whatever. I am nearly out with no antibiotic. Okay, I was stubborn, but I need to do everything else in the background to make sure that my body is able to fight the infection. Yeah. So just to make sure that not everyone, like everyone gets the right message. I'm a big believer that we do not need medication unless it's a very acute, acute case and we, you need life, life. Yeah. Intervention, in, intervention. But in long term, what I advise everyone and I believe in, you need to invest energy and time in the right conditions for the body. And the body has its own capacity of healing. So there's a few interesting things there that you brought up. One, you went through 
two months of a sinus infection without antibiotics. Most people don't want to go through two months of an infection. They just want an immediate solution. And this is the world we live in now where we want constant, immediate solutions. But the other thing is of not going down the road of antibiotics. I was in the GP um, about three weeks ago because um, one of my daughters was was sick with a vomiting bug. And there was posters in the waiting room about, you know, antibiotics um, only work for a small amount of things. It doesn't um, sort out viruses and, and, and so on. Because definitely years ago, there was this thing of any symptom you have, any illness, an antibiotic will sort. And people nearly were demanding a prescription of antibiotics from their GP. And probably m- more prescriptions were written for antibiotics than needed to be, where now there's this issue that the antibiotics are becoming less effective because our bodies have become used to the antibiotics, so they're not working on our symptoms anymore. Um, and and this is the thing, like, I mean, we've been around for who knows how many years, hundreds of thousands of years, and it's now I'm becoming more aware, of, and you can see these dramas and documentaries on the likes of Netflix of how medication, this new medication would have been introduced into um, America and was the answer. And then years later, it's all the knock on effects of the issues it caused people. And you can actually see it was all about corporate greed and so on, pushing through, you know, getting young girls who looked hot and amazing to entice the the doctor to try out the I was part of them for 10 years and that I wasn't looking great and whatever, but I'm telling you is real life. That's real. So I was medical representative for seven years. And that's exactly like the, the, the attraction for being part of that. And I was a top performer. I was spot on, like in my job. But so you were made believe that what you're selling is the greatest product ever. And, and then you I go was in very pushing. lucky. I could never, I had that verticality in me since I was a child. I don't know where it's coming. It's probably a gift. I could not sell anything that I didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. So I was promoting probiotics. (laughs) Okay. In, uh, so when you, I listened to you so uh, carefully when you said about the antibiotics and it made sense to me because I am, my body, my health is a victim of my mom needed to go to work when I had a constant throat infection, um, tonsillitis and all that on a regular basis, if I can say. And I was given antibiotics after antibiotics and after antibiotics and I wasn't breastfed. So not knowing what I know now, I look back and I see where is coming my episodes of arthritis every now and again, uh, my even my hormonal unbalanced who actually was the cause for my scoliosis and then my digestive issues and all that. So it was uh, so due I, over the use on, of antibiotics. And then I was promoting probiotics to counteract the effects of antibiotics and to teach the medical. It was, it was very challenging to, to do that work. And I realized how wobbly is the system. Yeah, yeah but it is a scary thing of the longer they keep us alive, the more money they make from yeah. us, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. I didn't even put that, yes, that aspect, but definitely. I know I'm a man and it's a controversial issue, but you mentioned breastfeeding. Do you think, you know, breastfeeding is really important? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I, I did everything what is my, what is in, was in my power to breastfeed my son uh, for as long as I could. Mm. Now, for me, it was three months and a half, something like that, because something happened to my uh, ex-husband health-wise, and uh, we went through hospitals and appointments and all that. So I uh, could not be with him. So in that moment, the connection, like, and I I had to. Uh, the stress uh, took a burden in on our relation my relationship with my son and breastfed and yeah because i know i wasn't breastfed 
Because in the early 80s, there was a thing in Ireland where they were telling mothers not to breastfeed. It was the same Iraman, yeah. And to use the the powder stuff yeah. you get on the shelf in supermarkets. Yeah, yeah so exactly. On. And I fully get that there's people who can't breastfeed and that having that option available is essential. I mean, imagine that my mom beca- uh, came to help me uh, with my baby when Lucas was born. And cons- I had to send her home because I couldn't uh, put up with her, give him uh, baby powder, like uh, ba- okay, pow- yeah, yeah. milk powder, give him the powder formula, give me the formula because he's not having. And I was measuring him. I knew exactly that he's like, he has enough and he's fed yeah, and yeah, all that. Yeah. And I said, okay, you better go home because you stressed the hell out of me and I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So uh, They can be stressful times, you exactly. know, there's a little infant and there's people giving their opinions on how to yeah, yeah. feed but, them and change uh, them. Defin- absolutely, absolutely. And Lucas was a child who probably used antibiotics three times in his own life and he's fine, thankfully. There's an interesting conversation as well about statins. Yes. Um, Another type of antibiotics. <laughs> is it? Yes. No, no, I'm messing. Okay. But I mean, the same danger, kind of, from where I stand. Like, I, I know friends of mine who have been put on medication. One is for cholesterol, another one is for diabetes. And they're young, um, as in, I'm, I consider myself young, so <laughs> they're young. <laughs> I'm giving them exactly. the label of young yeah. as well. But it, it's scary how people are just put on medication now, you know, at this very, very young age in their 40s for life. Yeah, that's that's for me the most um, scary part to work in a, to, to do this work in a part of the society or the life where we are so the, the power, our power, our inner power, our we are so disconnected from what we are as human beings. We've been conditioned though so much. Yes. So it's like, and I, I don't know what's the same in Romania, but before like, you know, the authority was the church, it was the police, the, the you know, your doctor has the authority still today. So anything that they say, and I'm not having to go with GPs or anything out there. Yeah, like, I'm I, not I've, met, I've met doctors as well who have very different opinions from what one says to what the other says. So it's not like it's a blanket consensus mm. that they all have. But if we're given something, you know, there's people who just don't get the second opinion or don't say, you know, can I make changes first before going down the road of long term medication? OK, so I will tell you that um, I had three episodes in my life where I was gobsmacked by their reaction and their answers to me. And I I could not take their answer as the final, the bottom line. I said, there, to me, it didn't make any sense. And I was looking for answers and I was looking to understand what's behind that. And I'm grateful that I did because that brought me to where I am now. So first was with the scoliosis and I did not understand how from a perfect family. We were so, my my grandma was a uh, a teacher and she was so careful to have a position, to not to read and to study in bed, to sit at the table, to whatever, all balanced. And we had a very um, set, I had personally a very settled routine as a child. So I had the perfect conditions. So, the the food was good, great, very good um, diet and all that. I didn't understand why my scoliosis. So I, it couldn't be explained to me why did I develop that scoliosis. That was the first one. And then before I had Lucas, I had a pregnancy uh, and I was 24. And I went through um, a twins pregnancy and... I lost the pregnancy when I was 23 weeks. Oh, wow. And I've been told that was because of a full moon. And in that night was so many. uh, And I mean, I'm a spiritual person. I know Mm. what full moon means. And I know like, but still like, and that was a nurse who told me that. And I was like, 
can you not explain what I understand it happens to certain extent, like to certain percentage. Okay, there is, I understand. But what happened to my body that I wasn't able to bring the pregnancy to the full? So my body perceived because of my spine, my whole anatomy and physiology of the body didn't allow the pregnancy to go to the full uh, development. It perceived, my body perceived that I'm ready because we're two. Okay, yes. Okay, they yeah, were yeah, both yeah. big. They were um, um, de normal, developed like a singular pregnancy. And my womb just opened normal and I went in labor and whatever. So now I'm, I understand now, but put a 24 years old woman, girl, I, I was very young at that stage and I could not understand. And what happened? I had that intuition telling me that, okay, you will be better if you have very fast, you, you get pregnant again and yeah, you yeah. get the child. So the healing process will be easier. But what happened was when I approached 21 weeks of pregnancy with Lucas, I got in a state of anxiety because I said, okay, it's going to happen yeah, again yeah, because I didn't know how many doctors, gynecologists I saw in between. I can't even remember how many, but was more than five. I went from the best city in Romania, medical-wise, to Hungary to find answers for that question. What happened to me, to my body, and how I can prevent to... No one sat down with me, sit down with me, to sit me down and explain what happened into my body and what it's not uh, it's not going to happen again or we have to do something to prevent yeah yeah until i said to my gynecologist yeah the baby in romania we do scans they do scans more often than here and you are going in private uh, all together uh and i i've been told oh the baby is nice it's good healthy whatever and i said yes but the mommy is not and he was looking at me and like what do you mean and I said, yeah, but do you remember that I'm approaching the same? And an extra um, check brought up the reason. Because I opened my mouth. Mm -hmm. Because I self-advocated for myself. So otherwise, I could have gone home and in two weeks to have the same, exactly the same experience. Just because I decided to open my mouth in that moment. And what did the extra check do or reveal? An extra check was the womb. So it the cervix. The cervix was prone to open uh, because of the spine yeah. condition. And they literally saw, so they sealed okay. the cervix wow. until the pregnancy was fully developed. And then so I if went they hadn't through. sealed it, yeah, it was yeah, yeah. miscarriage again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was just, I, I remember exactly like was today, yesterday, that moment when I said, I, mom is not enough, I could have very easily say, oh, the baby's fine, I'm going home, and that's it. Mm -hmm. the, the mo that's awareness. Yeah. That's deciding to self-advocate. That's this, the decision of choosing yourself. Don't minding what they've been told in school, that they don't have, that's what I'm trying to teach people and to, to teach my clients self-advocate don't be afraid to put yourself first yeah, yeah yeah because they don't put you first they put their own career first and in a very positive way i'm saying that mm. they put their own um career insurance all that you need to put you first yeah yeah, yeah. now one thing i will say that i do like what's happening uh a a across you know, the interaction you have with medical teams now, like GPs or nurses when you go, is this like making every contact count where, you know, you'll go in and, you know, most of them will say, you know, how are things otherwise? You know, how is everything else? How's how's your job going? How's life at home? And, uh, you know, so they're getting a more holistic. Yeah, it, I'm glad to you say that. I have probably less interaction with the medical world now, but... um that's never the case. It was never the case yeah. back then. No, no. So, yeah. So I was never asked how is my life, yeah. how stressed I am, how whatever. The first, actually, you are right. When I 
came in Ireland, uh, I had a moment of burnt out. I was working night shifts and day work and all that studying in the same time. And I had a burnt out and I went to the GB in Clonmel and he said, as long as you are my under my care, you are not going to do night shifts anymore. And he was the one who paid attention to how my life looks like and was the first time when I actually had the proper chat and care and all that. But normal, like, I mean, when you're going to a consultant, they don't really, uh, they don't have the luxury of the time. No, I no. don't think they they want to have, they have the pressure of patient after patient after patient. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And the rents that they're paying are just, <laughs> you know, like it's, no one's winning out. But statins, talk to me about statins. Because again, the information that's out there is, you know, high cholesterol is really bad. You know, I remember a friend of mine was giving off to me because I was saying, oh, I love omelets. And they said, oh, do you have them off? And I said, oh, I'm at an omelet a few times a week. And they're like, oh, that's too much cholesterol in your eggs. And so we're all being fed that cholesterol is bad and high cholesterol and there's high cholesterol in eggs and da 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 Okay, so there is recent... Um study what that show recent research that shows that there is no really connection between LDL cholesterol and the cardiovascular risk and deaths so heart attack and strokes that's one aspect the second aspect is LDL cholesterol is the bad cholesterol it it's called the bad cholesterol. Statins do lower LDL cholesterol. There is no doubt about that. A lot of studies shows that that's exactly what statins do. LDL cholesterol, in my uh, world, the body doesn't make anything, naturally, doesn't make anything bad to harm us. And I had my gallbladder removed. That was the third episode when, okay. And I'm suffering at times because there was no need for the, the gallbladder to be removed. Okay. So in, in an ultra specialized medical care system, what unfortunately that's what medical care system is, um, they look at the organ, they used to, they look at the organ, like the organ is separate and what that organ does, it, how to cut what is the bed and how to make the to work okay so they look at the liver and they saw there is an ldl what brings the uh the um vascular the clutters on the the arteries mm -hmm. but that the ldl is only are two ldls one is 80 percent is the healthy ldl what doesn't damage the artery and the 20% of the LDL is the bad guy. Okay. And you are in control. Your body knows exactly how much bad LDL to do, to make, if you give the right conditions. Now, the problem is that L that bad LDL is created by uh, glucose. Okay. And that's sugar. sugar. Yes. And it's not the sugar in the fruits. It's the sugar, the refined sugar. Okay, okay, processed. Processed sugar, yeah. And the carbs. Okay. That's the biggest problem. And everything what is fast food and uh, fast convenience. Yes, yes. The processed, the labels what are having more than 10 ingredients or whatever, and you don't understand half of them. Yeah. And Okay. So this is the problem. So LDL itself on a normal levels... Under the LDL, on the lipid profile mar uh, markers, is three glycerides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are the indicator for the cardio risk, okay. not the LDL. The LDL is okay. The LDL is the indicator for statins. Yes. That's why the doctors are using it. Because when you have... Uh, um, high level of LDL or higher level of LDL, you can prescribe statins. And I'm not going in that direction, okay? I'm not going in the explaining that, whatever. It's, I think you should question that. When your doctor is telling you, like it told one to one of my clients, um, once you are 55, uh, they are all on statins in America at least, uh, 
it's better to take the pressure off and to put your mind to ease and take the statins. I have an 82 years old, 83 years old, uh, my mom, my partner's mom. She's on statins for the, rest, for the last 15 years. She still has the mini strokes and the, all the side effects of statins. No lifestyle, lifestyle changes at all. Her diet is the same because she's on statins. So she expects the statins to do the job. That's yeah. where I'm getting so frustrated. Yes, yes. And um, the, everything else is not working. So I was reading something recently and I was saying that they're now noticing that if people take ibuprofen on a regular basis, that it actually uh, has a massive negative effect on gut bacteria. And we all need good gut bacteria for overall, you know, well-being and functioning and stuff of the body. What are the side effects of taking statins? So the three side effects, main side effects of the statins are uh, dementia-like symptoms. So you're not actually having dementia, but you have... Uh, dementia-like symptoms, um, the um, cataracts, okay, yeah, and the pain in the joints and the uh, arthritis. That's what I know. Yeah. Probably there are more, but the most relevant, prevalent one is the dementia-like symptoms, and a lot of people are complaining that they are forgetful and all that. And you see, if you are looking at the group age. People, those people are prone to, so I think pharma very much relied mm. on, ah, that won't be very much put on the statins, but that's, people, it's clear, I'm coming from a, 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 a place where I'm monitoring these things on a daily basis. So it's clear people who stopped taking the, the statins, they don't have those episodes. I remember when skimmed milk came into Ireland and it was a thing uh, and then low fat milk and low fat yogurt and you know the fat is bad and uh, so everyone then were having just kind of your your carbs and your protein and now there seems to be a little bit more clarity coming through where it's actually you no know, good fat is good so don't yeah. be taking the skim milk take your full fat milk if you want to drink milk take your full fat yogurt instead of your zero percent to your low fat because there's all the stuff in that to make it tasty mm. uh, and, and all this so i think you know we all need to be aware of just because information comes out and it says that this is the new thing that we should be doing just question it as well because i think we really need to go back to low ingredients in yes. a product and that's the bottom natural, line natural yeah. ingredients and also lifestyle Yes, exactly. So food is one part of the lifestyle, but there are another five there what we need to pay attention. So in the food direction, I'm just going to say that I have a philosophy. So the most, the, the closest is the food to its form in nature, mm -hmm. the better is. Yeah. That should be your indicator and bottom line. So the comparison with what. So for example, I have been asked if the um, rice cakes Oh yeah, are healthy. Think of the rice and how long it takes from the rice, the grain, mm. to have the rice cakes. And you have the the answer yeah. there. You don't have me. You don't need me to tell you what. Yeah. So the process is very long. The same with ketchup or whatever. So it's when it's very long processed and you can't make at home. So if yeah. something can be made at home. Mm, okay, look at the ingredients and see. Uh, but if it's something what you can't make at home, forget about it. Like you did a brilliant video on LinkedIn one day and you're going through different milks and even your almond milk and your oat milk and actually breaking that down into like um, the oat milks that are out there. What are the actual good ones to get? Um, yeah, it's probably it in, in Ireland, it's one one brand. I never came across with a second one. It's one brand what is on the market shelf what has three ingredients. It's rude, is it? It's rude. Yeah. Rude health, yeah, yeah. Rude health, oat milk. Yeah, exactly. Oat milk, coconut milk. And from all the alternative milks, coconut is the closest to the, is less processed because doesn't have, so because it's the fat in mm. the coconut, and by the way, coconut is a healthy fat, um, uh, has the capacity of being shelf life, natural, longer, and they don't need to put too much 
in its tool. Yeah. Yeah, because it was it was amazing. I I took my oat milk out of the, the fridge because I've been I've changed from dairy, dairy. To, mm-hmm. to oat, thinking I'm doing the right thing and so on. But you, it was you amazing the dairy. ingredients in the oat. Yeah, milk. yeah. So basically, my my approach in regard to milk is as an adult, you don't need milk because there is a peptide what your liver needs to release in order to break down the protein in the milk. And that peptide re- uh, increases inflammation all over in the body. And one factor what we don't need to increase unnecessarily mm. is inflammation because yeah. it then can stay up for no reason. And drinking milk every day, imagine that your inflammation is. And that's why I don't encourage. Now, food, dairy, other dairy products like yogurt and cottage cheese that will be, or kefir, that will be my favorite. So get your calcium from that. Yes, and no, not necessarily for the calcium, but for the protein. Okay, but, but they say the like a, after a menopause for a woman that they're low in calcium and that can lead to, you know, more brittle yeah. bones and so on. King's um, College uh, University in London, they just released recently a study showing that uh, it's not calcium what causes the the brittle uh, bones and all that. But we do need calcium. Cal- calcium is involved in not only in nervous um, um, system and all that. So we do need calcium. But the milk, it's one product. Mm. Or the dairy, it's one product. Um, leafy greens are very high in calcium. Almonds are very high in calcium. Oh. Sardines are very high in calcium. So my, I do not drink milk because I can't process. But I do have probably too much calcium in a little bit too much calcium. So that was my last uh, blood testing tested in March. So it I was at the higher limit of calcium, which was a surprise for me, knowing that I'm not eating milk at all. Yeah. yeah. So I'm eating everything else. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I suppose the takeaway points for people here are to try and eat something that is as natural as possible. Mm-hmm. That really is not processed. So even if you're, if you're deciding between an apple or a couple of plain biscuits, obviously take the apple because it's Obvious. natural. Yeah, exactly. Because um, I brought an apple and some biscuits today. <laughs> so I, I did both. Uh, but I mean, it's probably a conversation that could go on for hours and hours and hours in terms of what people should eat and so on. And I think this is really where people just need to go and reach out to you. And there's there's a few really cool things happening, which I, I, I want to mention to our listeners. One is you do in-person, in-person masterclasses where people can all come together. And it, it, they're small enough groups, maybe 10 or 12 people. Uh, and you do cooking together. It's an all day thing. And you, you go through different ingredients and the foods, why this food and not this, that food. And like, there's people who come back and do it again because they enjoy it yes, so much. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's yeah. a real communal experience and it's fun, but there's huge knowledge and insights there. And I think, you know, having that experience with someone in person is massive. You're also going to be uh, releasing various courses Mm-hmm. through your website and one of them coming up can we say what it is yes it's an optimal cholesterol optimal cholesterol and that is really helping people it's not only food it is main mainly food because this is my my favorite uh, topic but uh it's lifestyle yeah yeah because all these changes so the food is the bottom line that's the foundation but in order the the health to to install or to reinstall after a period of missing, uh, um, you need more than the food. So the foundation is okay, but you need to build towards. So you take out what is not working for you and you bring in what is working and what makes you healthier. So it, the, the whole lifestyle and obvious, I, I have a big passion of uh, touching the emotional side as well because we are human beings. We can deny our emotions no, no no absolutely and you of course you do one-on-one yes um, i do one-to-one work, yeah, workshops yeah. with people as well and accountability is a big factor in that which i 100%, think is so important yeah, yeah. because you know 
people are coming to you with issues and it's one thing saying, OK, this is the solution, but it's very important to actually have someone there driving you on and encouraging you and supporting you because it's often hard for people to make lifestyle changes. I will only say something about the um, the blockages. I come across with a lot of people who are saying, I tried so many diets. I tried so many programs. I was in slimming world and in all that. And I bounced back. And I, I don't know why. It's a limiting belief there. And that's why my work is so valuable and it's so effective because I'm working. And it's so unique, I'd say, for the moment. I do not have knowledge of someone putting those two together mm-hmm. yet, but I'm sure that's the direction. Um, I'm l- talking about a, a limiting belief. So the person who tried a lot of diets and didn't, um, or programs, and didn't have the capacity or the program wasn't okay and didn't follow the 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 principles the the right way to to reach the goals and to be to deliver sustainable changes or the person doesn't believe or doesn't see himself or herself losing weight and then you need to work on programming and you need to work on the subconscious mind and you have to know how to do that because there it takes a bit of work and a bit of knowledge and tools and all that so once I identify that and that's probably my gift that I am able to spot that in a few sessions if it's a limiting belief on an emotional level we are able to unpack that and work on and that's why my clients have success on long term. Fantastic. And if people want to get more information, go to Smandra's website, AuthenticHealth.ie. But you're also moving in to the world of podcasting. And writing a book. Brilliant. <laughs> yes. So these are my two big projects. Um, first will be the podcast and... The second is my book, who is, which is going to bring together my personal life and a bit of advice. Like, it's probably me talking to me back then, me now talking to my old self and reflecting on what lessons I learned throughout my life story. Excellent. Well, I'm delighted to... When I choose, when you choose you, that's the title of the book, so... Oh. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Um, well, I'm delighted to welcome and invite you into the family of the GK Media world because you'll be releasing your podcast series uh, in collaboration with GK Media Studios. And we look forward to supporting you and hearing so many more nuggets of wisdom and advice that you'll be dispensing on listeners. And without sounding condescending, just well done, you. It's been. Thank you. It's been some challenge. Thank you so much for helping me to share and to give me the chance to open a little bit more. And thank you so much for making me so comfortable because it wasn't an easy topic, but uh, I, I have to say it was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks a million. Thank you.